CNN will soon be airing a powerful new documentary entitled Crisis, America Not in Crisis. The documentary will detail the crisis hitting America's newsrooms as all across this nation, from 8th Avenue in Manhattan all the way to H Street in Washington, D.C., journalists are realizing that the racial tensions tearing this country apart exist largely from 8th Avenue in Manhattan all the way to H Street in Washington, D.C. The crisis was sparked after shocking videos of life outside a narrow corridor of land near the East Coast somehow found their way into American newsrooms. These videos, largely taken during Hurricane Harvey in Texas, showed amazing scenes of yucky, ordinary Americans treating each other with civility, kindness, and respect, even as America's journalists were slavering with sneering hatred for them because they're different than America's slavering, hate-filled journalists. In one amazing rescue involving helicopters, small watercraft, and police dogs, CNN's Chris Cuomo was airlifted out of an ideological bubble in which he'd been trapped for 47 years. In the wake of the rescue, Cuomo witnessed scenes of Texans he absolutely despised doing nicer things for one another than he'd ever done for anyone. Cuomo then gave an interview to his own hand in which he said, quote, Oh, my dear hand, to whom I've been talking almost exclusively for as long as I can remember, it now seems I've been reporting on seething racism in an America that exists almost entirely inside my own imagination. Oh, please, my beloved hand, send me back to that imag imaginary America forever, lest I have to change my mind about anything or admit to myself that the ordinary Americans I hate are actually better people than I am." Unquote. In another crisis scene at the offices of the New York Times, a former newspaper, emergency workers labored overtime to shore up the minds of journalists lest they perceive that they've been covering a small number of black activist conmen playing off an even smaller number of white supremacist losers in order to instigate localized riots and protests that create the illusion that a generally friendly and prosperous America is coming apart at the seams. In a statement released to the Hamptons, New York Times editor Blithering Prevarication III announced, quote, it would be a crisis of unprecedented proportions if our readers should ever suspect that the poverty, high crime, and anger in many inner city neighborhoods are not the result of American racism, but of the poor social policies and race mongering lies we've been promoting for 60 years. Unquote. As the crisis of non crisis deepens, many journalists are beginning to fear that Americans may soon discover that more than half of the angry white men they say voted for Donald Trump were not men or not white meaning the country looks nothing like they say it does. As Clinton's surrogate George Stephanopoulos said in an interview with ABC's top journalist George Stephanopoulos, quote, we must build stronger levees and sturdier infrastructure to keep America's newsrooms from being flooded by reality, unquote. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo Ship shaped, tipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. Oh, hooray, hooray. Okay, we are back, and uh, California burned down, and North Korea set off a hydrogen bomb, so as clavenless we can go, it wasn't so bad. Uh, we did, we did. On the tame side. <laughs> That's right, it was on the tame side, and Hurricane Irma is heading for next clavenless weekend, is heading for Florida. It's the mailbag tomorrow. Woo! Tomorrow is the mailbag, so you don't have much time. You have to be a subscriber, but if you're a subscriber, you can send in questions about your personal life, your religious thoughts, politics. I will answer them all, and answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life now and then for the better. So you go on the website, right? Yeah. I'm going to get this right. You go on the website, you go to the podcast place, press the button. You can send in your questions, send them in now and we'll answer them. If you want, we can do it live, but you got to be a subscriber, which is only a lousy 10 bucks a month. I mean, come on, we will change your life for a lousy 10 bucks a month. If you want to subscribe for the year, it's a hundred bucks and you get the leftist tears tumbler. The Leftist Tears Tumblr comes complete with Leftist Tears and refills automatically every time Donald Trump makes a speech. 
<laughs> you know, a lot of times people will tell you, you know, what, what do you do to keep your relationships uh, fresh, to keep your marriage fresh, to keep, you know, from getting bored over time? And you want to you want to try every now and again to surprise your beloved with something he or she is not expecting. So you might try like waiting <laughs> till she's, you know, half asleep and then suddenly, you know, jumping into the room in a big, you know, mask from Halloween and screaming and holding a dagger over her head or... You could send her flowers. Flowers, I'm guessing, probably uh, the yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So proflowers.com is the place to go. You can get, you know, they want to help you surprise someone for no reason at all while also surprising you with a special deal. You can get 20% off any of their unique summer rose bouquets or any other bouquet of $29 or more. They have these colorful rainbow roses, which are always a hit if you aren't sure what to send somebody, and they're guaranteed to stay fresh for at least seven days or your money back, and you control the delivery date. Pro Flowers gives you more bloom for your buck, big, beautiful flowers with more stems for your money. I use them all the time and they really are good. They're guaranteed they come fresh. They come with this little water sponge in them so they stay fresh and with food you can give them. If you want to get 20% off summer roses or any other bouquet of $29 or more, go to proflowers.com and use my code AK at checkout. How do you spell it? AK at checkout. That's proflowers.com and code AK. Don't wait to make someone's day. First, before we get to the news, and there is news breaking even as we speak, uh, I have to issue a correction. I made a mistake last week. I what? cannot. I know. I know. This happened to me once before. It was July of 1967. I made a mistake, and I made another one, and it was a dumb mistake too, because I said that Texas. I wasn't sure Texas was in the Confederacy, and what's so dumb? Of course, Texas was, of course, in the Confederacy. And what was so dumb about this is I frequently, even on the show, have talked about the fact that John Quincy Adams argued with Andrew Jackson about whether Texas should be allowed in. Uh, back into the country from Mexico because it, he said, Adam said, it's going to cause it, there'll be a civil war. If you let a slave state back in, they're gonna, there's going to be a civil war. So I always say, like, you know, was it worth having the civil war to get Texas? And I think nowadays, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So anyway, I was wrong. Texas in the Confederacy, of course, of course it was. All right. So we're, now the summer is over. All the stuff is going to heat up. So this is going to be a big, big moment for our friend Donald Trump. This is going to be a big time because we're, we're going to there's going to be a shift. You're going to see over the next month or two. You're going to see a shift in perspective. We've already passed from the Trump is Hitler phase into uh, the Trump is unfit for office phase, right? So this is a new thing that we're dealing with. And soon, because there's going to be so much for Congress to deal with, you're going to be dealing now with the Trump's policies are bad thing, which is once they do that, uh, I, I believe that Trump is going to, that's going to be to Trump's advantage because most people agree with his policies. Today, Trump announced, or actually it was Jeff Sessions, the AG, the Attorney General, announced that they are getting rid of DACA, the so-called Dream Act, which how can I put this? This was a Barack Obama act. You remember that all those uh, people were coming down from Central America and they were being allowed into the country. They were flooding the country and Obama was putting them in people's towns and just putting them everywhere. And he basically suspended any kind of uh, you know, deportation for them if they were under 31, I believe the, the number was. They kept saying it's for children, but it was not. It was, and, and also they weren't coming with their parents. The parents were putting them on trains and sending them over because they realized, why not? Why not? Nobody was doing anything about it. So here's Jeff Sessions making the announcement that they are going to get rid of it, but it's going to be in place for 60 days, for six months, I'm sorry, to allow uh, Congress to make a law if they want, because this was just an executive order. This is cut number 12. I'm here today to announce that the program known as DACA that was effectuated under the Obama administration is being rescinded. The DACA program was implemented in 2012 and essentially provided a legal status for recipients for a renewable two-year term, worker authorization, and other benefits including participation in the Social Security program uh, to 800,000 mostly adult illegal aliens. The policy was implemented unilaterally to great controversy and legal concern after Congress rejected legislative proposals to extend similar benefits uh, to, on numerous occasions to this same group of illegal aliens. 
In other words, the executive branch, through DACA, deliberately sought to achieve what the legislative branch specifically refused to authorize on multiple occasions. So in other words, this is essentially Obama saying he's not going to enforce the law. Now, Obama did this a number of times. He did it with the uh, the Marriage Act. Remember Clinton's Marriage Act that defined marriage as between a man and a woman? He said, we're just not going to enforce it. Now, think about this for a minute, because what that means is that the people you elect to make the laws can make all the laws they want, but King Barack is allowed to say, I'm not going to enforce it. So that essentially means the law goes away. So Congress passes a law and Barack Obama says he's not going to enforce it. And Jeff Sessions, being the attorney general, went right to this part of the argument about it. This is cut number 13. Such an open-ended circumvention of immigration laws was an unconstitutional exercise of authority by the executive branch. The effect of this unilateral executive amnesty, among other things, contributed to a surge of minors at the southern border that yielded terrible humanitarian consequences. It also denied jobs to hundreds of thousands of Americans by allowing those same illegal aliens to take those jobs. We inherited from our founders and have advanced an unsurpassed legal heritage, which is the foundation of our freedom our safety, and our prosperity. As Attorney General, it is my duty to ensure that the laws of the United States are enforced and that the constitutional order is upheld. Okay, now, so Sessions is basically getting right to the point of the, of the matter, that Obama was transgressing against the way we make laws. And here is a former... Uh, a high-ranking official who agreed that this could not be done. This is cut number 10. With respect to uh, the notion that I can just suspend deportations through executive order, uh, that's just not the case uh, because there are laws on the books that Congress has passed. Uh, and I know that everybody here at Bell is studying hard, so you know that we've got three branches of government. Uh, Congress passes the law. The executive branch's job is to enforce and implement those laws. And then the judiciary has to uh, interpret uh, the laws. There are enough laws on the books by Congress that are very clear in terms of how we have to enforce uh, our immigration system. That for me to simply, through executive order, ignore those congressional mandates uh, would uh, not conform with my appropriate role as president. <laughs> so Obama, you know, I, I picked that, that particular one out. <clears throat> Obama said this for years. He said it again and again. He must have said over 20 times that he could not do what he then went ahead and did because like Henry VIII, it took Obama a long time to realize that nobody was going to penalize him for anything because the press worshiped him and the GOP was afraid of the press. They kept saying, we're not going to do anything to you. We're not going to do anything to you. And he got more and more and more lawless as his administration went on. So at first, you know, that was him talking to Univision. So he's talking to these people who, who were saying to him, why can't you just, you know, make a law? But he, he is now promising, boy, he's going to come out and make a statement. He should make that statement again. <laughs> so we're going to get back to this in a minute because it's really, really interesting the way the press makes people argue about this in a way that has nothing to do with it. Now, I have talked before about how every morning I come in here and people are so nice and everybody's so nice. And one of the things they always say to me is, how on earth did someone like you get a job in a nice place like this. And the reason is we didn't use ZipRecruiter.com. I was just standing on the street. I was hitchhiking. They said, get in the car and we'll give you a podcast. So what did I know? I got in the car. They gave me a podcast. But if you use ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. And then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you, it finds them. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate to the site within one day, and each and every one of them has turned me down for work. That's how you know that these are sharp, intelligent people. This way, there's no with ZipRecruiter, there's no juggling emails or calls to your office. You simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. 
And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. It doesn't get much better than that. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. All one word, Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter dot com slash daily wire one more time to try it for free go to ziprecruiter.com slash daily wire don't let someone like me happen to you all right so so let's let's go back to sessions for a minute and sessions basically puts forward what this issue is about this cut 14. no greater good for the overall health and well-being of our republic than preserving and strengthening the impartial rule of law Societies where the rule of law is treasured are societies that tend to flourish and succeed. Societies where the rule of law is subject to political whims and personal biases tend to become societies afflicted by corruption, poverty, and human suffering. It is that clear and that easy, okay? You got the rule of law, things go well, you have no rule of law, things go badly. Now, let me show you, I, I really want to talk for a couple of minutes here about the way the press makes people stupid. Okay. And let's start, let's start with how stupid they are in order to get to the really, really stupid, uh, depths of press stupidity in stupid land. You have to travel to the New York times op-ed page, or as we call it, knucklehead row. The chief knucklehead, one of the, no, that's not true. One of the chief knuckleheads on Knucklehead Row is David Brooks, who was brought on to be their house conservative. He's not conservative. He's the guy who thought Obama was going to be a great president because he loved the sharp crease on Obama's pants. I swear that's what he said. I thought, like, if, if you like the crease, why not elect the, his dry cleaner to be president? You know, it's like we could, have, we could have somebody who actually accomplished something. I just want to put forward... This is uh, David Brooks from Knucklehead Row, but he's on PBS, and he's talking about the lessons he learned from Hurricane Harvey. And you got to listen carefully to this because it really is amazing how closed-minded someone can be. What did we see at Hurricane Harvey? We saw that the Southerners with their hats were suddenly, they're not racist. They're helping everybody. Everybody was helping each other. Houston, one of the most integrated cities in the, uh, one of the most diverse, we'll call it, uh, cities in the country. That's what we saw. We saw that everything the press has been telling us about who we are and who America is and who America between New York and L.A. is was all untrue. It was all untrue. So what did uh, David Brooks learn from that? To me, the two biggest things that happened was first, Houston came together. And that's significant because Houston is the most ethnically diverse city in this country. And there's an argument that's sometimes made, oh, we, it, we'll never have solidarity as a nation if we're so ethnically diverse. Well, Houston does it. And so if they can do it, I think that argument against making our country diverse or opening up more immigration falls down. The second thing is that I think as Washington becomes more dysfunctional, power is going to the cities and states. And I thought the, the basic efficacy of the Houston government this week is, is further sign that that may have to happen even more. <laughs> so, so he sees people working together and he says, well, that means we can have more immigration. What has that got to do with anything? Who is saying, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure there are some people saying we don't want people coming in because they're Mexican, but that's not what anybody is really talking about. They're talking about the rule of law. They're talking, you know, the way they do this is they reduce everything to a narrative. Everything you see on the press is a narrative. And then you see that echoed even by smart people on Twitter and on all the social media where they start to argue about the narratives. Before I get to that, I want to show it to you because it really is amazing when you see them when you see them doing it. It just is an amazing thing to watch. We're talking about the narratives of DACA. But before we talk about that, let us talk about business travel. Because if you're in a big business, if you work for a huge corporation, you've got a whole department that deals with business travel. But if you're in a small business, if you run your own business or you've just got a couple of employees and you have to travel on business, where do you go? I will tell you. You go to upside.com. Upside.com knows that you need somebody to take care of the deals that you can they get you the deals that you can get as a business. Upside has the absolute best available prices for flights, hotel and rental cars for business travel. You can get Upside will reward you with a gift card card to places like amazon.com every time you buy a business trip. 
And they have this amazing, they call it the six-star treatment. It's even better than five-star treatment. It's the six-star treatment you'll get from Upside's customer service specialist. They call them navigators. So it's a triple win. Recently, a navigator noticed an Upside user was booked in a middle seat on a three-hour plus fight. So the navigator upgraded her to an aisle seat with more leg room. That's the way they take care of you if you work for a big corporation. That's the way Upside takes care of you if you work for a small business. That's just one example of how Upside navigators go above and beyond for business travelers. Imagine what they'll do for you. Upside navigators are instantly accessible 24-7 by voice, chat, email, or message on the Upside app, even reaching out to you with careful, useful info to help you avoid a problem before it happens. I will start your Upside six-star treatment right now. You go to Upside.com and use my code Andrew, and you'll get a minimum $100 gift card to Amazon.com, which you can send to me out of gratitude. No, I made that part up. Keep it for yourself. Use it yourself. That's code Andrew at Upside.com for a minimum $100 gift card to Amazon.com when you buy your next business trip at Upside.com. Upside.com, you deserve a better business trip. Minimum purchase required to see the site for complete details. In fact, go on the site because it's really easy to use and you'll see what they're talking about. We got a break from Facebook and YouTube. But remember, tomorrow is the mailbag. So those questions that have been bugging you your entire life can now be answered. In fact, all the problems of your life can be solved. They won't be, but they could be. You never know. So you've got to subscribe. It's a lousy 10 bucks a month. If you subscribe for the year, it's a lousy 100 bucks, and you get the Leftist Tears Tumblr. Come on. Come on over to thedailywire.com. You can listen to the rest of the show. So as we move into this new political season, and as the f f narrative that uh, Trump is Hitler has failed. And as the narrative that Trump is crazy is starting to fail, it's going to be Trump is mean. Trump is mean. Trump's policies are mean. They're not the best thing for America. And of course, this one is easy because what you're doing is you're finding, we all have this idea that these are little tiny children who were brought in, cradled in their lovely mother's arms, and now we have to be protected from deportation. And the thing is, what, what the press wants to do is they want to make everything a story, and then they only want to tell you one kind of story. So just, I mean, just look at this. This is Alison Camerata on CNN. I mean, this is absurd, asking the really tough questions of a guy who says, he, a young man who says he's a dreamer. Angel, you've called the possibility of this terrifying. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's terrifying that we can... Uh, be so easily betrayed by um, the government asking us to uh, give so much information that we had to give uh, to be accepted into DACA and then to have it turned around on a very exceptional group of people. I want to ask you about that because when you heard the idea that there was going to be this DACA program and that dreamers like yeah. you brought here at four years old were going to be protected, did you have second thoughts? about giving your oh, information to the government? Yeah, there was a very significant discussion um, that my parents had to have with me at that time. I was 17 at the time. And that was kind of the, ver the first big conversation that I had to have with my parents about uh, my legal residency here, my residency uh, status. And it was a, it was a risk. So seems like a nice young fellow, right? And, and I'm sure there are plenty of these guys who are nice young fellows and plenty who are bad. So do we tell this story? I mean, you can just bet. I love the tough questions she's answers. You're terrified. What do you mean by terror? What are you, why are you terrified? Why is Trump so mean? Why is Trump being so mean to you? I mean, they're always asking the tough questions. So this is the thing. You are supposed to think that this is a story about narratives. And of course, this is the narrative they leave out. Here is a father testifying before Congress that a dreamer killed his son. My name is Jamil Shaw. My son, Jamil Andre Shaw II, was murdered by a dreamer, DACA recipient, a child brought to this country by no fault of his own. My family's peace and freedom were stolen by an illegal alien from Mexico. He was brought here by his illegal alien parents and allowed to grow up as a wild animal. Some people believe that if you are brought over by no fault of your own, that, that it makes you a good person. They want us to believe that Dream Act kids don't murder. I am here to debunk that myth. 
Kids brought over the border by no fault of their own do kill Americans. How many Americans killed by illegal aliens are too many? One, two, hundred, thousand, hundred thousand? Ask any parent whose child was murdered by an illegal alien how many is too many. Well, that's right. Because why? Because then when your kid is killed, you know, God forbid, then suddenly that's the narrative. That becomes the narrative. But my question is this, like, why is this an issue of narratives? We all know that people, you know, people are pretty much the same all over. Culture affects them. But basically, if they come to a new culture and they can acclimate to that culture, they'll become like that culture. We know we've been doing this for a hundred years, assimilating people from all over the world. We can assimilate people from Mexico. We can assimilate people from other countries. That's not the problem. They're going to be bad ones. They're going to be good ones. Maybe the fact that they're breaking the law coming into the country militates, you know, tilts the balance toward bad people, maybe, because it's self-selecting for people who are willing to break the law. But, but that's not the issue. That is not the issue. This is not a question of narratives. And this is why, this is why the Republicans are always swimming upstream and why he gets scurvy. Like, John McCain is picking on Trump for this and, um, uh, Paul Ryan, you know, I used to be a fan of Paul Ryan's because of his tr attempt to reform the entitlement programs, but he is really bobbling the Trump administration. He doesn't know which way to turn. All of these guys were like, you know, making noise about how they, that Obama was violating the rule of law. Here is why I think, and I will say, I think Trump is 100% right in what he's doing. I think he's right to end DACA, it's unconstitutional. It makes, uh, it, I think, any challenge to it, aside from the corruption of certain leftist judges, any challenge to it, if it gets to the Supreme Court, it's going to be cut down. It is going to be cut down. There are people saying they're going to sue, you know, like Andrew Cuomo in New York saying, we're going to sue him. You know, sue over what? Sue that he stopped something that was illegal and he has given Congress six months. And so people are saying, well, that's throwing the responsibility back to Congress where they make the laws. That is what this story is about. The absolute abandonment by Barack Obama and, and the left of the rule of law has caught people in the middle of this. I know people are going to suffer. I know good people are going to suffer. But somewhere along the line, if somebody doesn't bite the bullet and bring back the rule of law, there's going to be a lot more suffering. Trump is right. He's casting this back. He's putting this, the onus for this back into Congress. And everybody is sort of saying, well, why did he do that? Why didn't he fix it? Why? He can't fix it. He's just the president. He's got to give it to the people who should have done something about it before they actually, they did do something about it before. They refused to give people uh, amnesty. Let's see if they do that again. And if he is pushing this so that, you know, there's, there was one story that he turned to people and said, get me out of this. Because <laughs> he promised, Trump promised he was going to get rid of this thing. But, but if they say, well, now we've got to do something about this and they pass a law that says maybe let people who are already here stay, but nobody else or whatever, at least it's being done constitutionally. The rule of law is the thing that is at issue. And all these stories about this dreamer is a murderer and this dreamer is a lovely victim of, of circumstance, they don't mean anything. I mean, it's not, it's not that I want to harden my heart against people. It's that there's going to be stories on both sides. It's not about the stories. It's about passing laws that we can obey, that we can abide by. And right now that has been entirely abandoned. I just want to, before I get to the cultural segment of our show, because we had a lot to talk about in the culture, I, we have to talk about uh, North Korea. O over the weekend, North Korea, Kim Jong-un uh, set off, uh, seemed to have set off a test that he says was a hydrogen bomb. And obviously a hydrogen bomb much more powerful than an A-bomb. It is fusion, not fission, right? It's fusion and fusion involves fission so that it's just like a lot stronger. A hydrogen bomb would be a lot stronger. That it's, that's yeah. pretty science. That sounded like I knew what I was talking yeah. about, right? And Texas was in the Confederacy as well. Uh, so, so Nikki Haley, who is just, I mean, I feel, I really feel for Nikki Haley. You know, she's out there talking to these people, the most useless body of human beings on earth, this, the United Nations, you know, they're sitting there going, you know, when can we get out to our prostitutes? You know, it's like, and she is like bleeding with them. And so she goes, she really went off and she's upping the ante. Uh, let's, let's take this to cut number three. The time has come to exhaust all of our diplomatic means before it's too late. We must now adopt the strongest possible measures. Kim Jong-un's action cannot be seen as defensive. He wants to be acknowledged as a nuclear power. 
But being a nuclear power is not about using those terrible weapons to threaten others. Nuclear powers understand their responsibilities. Kim Jong-un shows no such understanding. His abusive use of missiles and his nuclear threats show that he is begging for war. War is never something the United States wants. We don't want it now. But our country's patience is not unlimited. We will defend our allies and our territory. Begging for war. And just to add, put an addendum on that, uh, the Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis came out of a meeting with the president and all the uh, security guys, and this is what he said. He added to that. We have many military options, and the president wanted to be briefed on each one of them. Uh, we made clear that we have the ability to defend ourselves and our allies, South Korea and Japan, uh, from any attack, and our commitments among the allies are ironclad. Uh, any threat to the United States or its territories, including Guam uh, or our allies, will be met with a massive military response, a response both effective and overwhelming. King Jong-un should take heed of the United Nations Security Council's unified voice. All members unanimously agreed on the threat North Korea poses, and they remain unanimous in their commitment to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Because we are not looking to the total annihilation of a country, namely North Korea. But as I said, we have many options to do so. So, so he's basically saying, you know, don't touch that dial. We will blow you into the next century. I mean, they're, they're really talking tough. Meanwhile, the, the, the Norks are basically making fun of him. Uh, Han Tai Sung, the ambassador uh, from North Korea to the UN, uh, he said, the recent self-defense measures by my country are a gift package addressed to none other than the U.S. The U.S. will receive more gift packages from my country as long as it relies on reckless provocations and futile attempts to put pressure on North Korea. Korea. You know, I think we can all agree that Kim Jong-un's personality would be deeply improved by a missile in the nose. You know, I think we can all say that, like, we would love to see this guy blown up. And I, my suspicion is that uh, Trump is not going to sit around and let this get worse and worse, that he will do something. But I think what he the things that he will do will probably be a lot less dramatic than uh, wiping the country off the face of the map, as satisfying as that would be at this point. I think they're going to involve uh, the, that kind of long-term strategy of overthrowing the government, of encouraging North Korean dissidents, of cutting off trade and getting in the way of their trade. You know, China and Russia, this notion that China or Russia are going to help us, they love this stuff. They, they think this is funny. Little crazy man is making... Uh, America nuts. They, they, they're they happy with the whole thing. But they're not our friends. But I think that uh, undermining the regime is the way to go and possibly at some point killing them, you know? Like, I, I, this is one of the things about the 60s is the, the, kid, the people in the 60s ruined everything, right? They got all upset about, you remember like the born identity, oh, I'm killing people for the government, you know? <laughs> it's just like, I'm killing us. Please, please, you know? I mean, this was in the 60s, like, oh, the CIA is assassinating people. We're as bad as everybody else. Oh, we're over, we're, we're supporting, you know, fascist governments to keep the communists out. Like, that's what, that's what we were supposed to do. That's, that's a good idea. And like taking out this guy and making, you know, just sneaking up in the back of him with a pin and exploding him because he looks like a gigantic balloon would not be a bad idea. Which brings me to another insane leader of a, a country, Taylor Swift. Okay, she's not really a leader of a country, but she's the leader of the country of our hearts. And uh, I, this, this is an amazing thing. Taylor Swift has a new album out. And, you know, Taylor Swift went from being this sweet, I mean, everybody knows, she went from being this sweet girl writing country songs about the tears on her guitar because her high school boyfriend wouldn't, um, wouldn't, didn't love her and love somebody else, love the cheerleader or whatever. And I'm not, I'm not a big fan of any kind of popular music, but she was good. Those songs were actually, you know, I thought those songs actually reflected a certain kind of teenager and a certain kind of high school and a certain, and, and you know, you're the reason for the tears on my guitar. It's actually a good line for a country song. I mean, it's not, a, you know, those are actually good songs. 
then she just started sleeping with everybody, I mean, basically. And like all female singers, all, every single female singer on earth has managers telling her that she's not doing the right thing and she has to do something else. And they all eventually corrupt these people. So she went from being someone who could have been a big country star probably forever. She went pop and now she has gone absolutely weird. I mean, this is genuinely weird. And she has put out this new song Called, what's it called? Do you, what, look what you made me do. Okay. Yeah. And if you, if you can't see because you're so cheap, you haven't spent the lousy 10 bucks to subscribe. If you can't see it, it opens with this pan over this really grim graveyard. This is a sweet little girl. We, we knew just years ago, she was a sweet little high school girl. This grim graveyard. And they get to a big grave that says Taylor Swift's reputation. And then she arises out of it like a zombie. Here is just a clip of this song. <laughs> you know, apparently the song is filled with like obscure references to all these guys who've done all this stuff to Taylor Swift, you know, like because she keeps throwing her body around. <laughs> She's now in all this kind of trouble. My favorite comment on this was from The Onion. Their headline was Taylor Swift unveils <laughs> even darker persona with new single skull effing maggot blank boyfriend. <laughs> I can't even say what it says. She's, it starts, from the moment we see her chewing the entrails of a bound and gagged man wrapped in coils of barbed wire, it's obvious this is a version of Taylor we definitely haven't seen before. So, I mean, it's just getting darker and darker and darker. The other thing about this, though, is a number of culture commentators have said, oh, this is music for the Trump generation right? Vulture devouring culture. And I mention them, they are a, a culture site, but I mention them only because they're representative, uh, of, they're representative of a lot of different cultural commentaries. Just as we reach the final dregs and leftovers phase of summer, the first pure, truly emblematic, undeniable piece of pop art of the Trump era landed right in our laps. Two nights before the fight, Taylor Swift unloaded her new single, and although Trump still seemed wedded to you, can always can't always get what you want as a signature rally closer. He really should consider an update. Swift's tour de force of defected petulance is amazing. It's essentially a catalog of every public feud she's had. And she's, he basically goes on to say that this is, he says, this is the anthem of the Trump administration that turns the abrogation of personal responsibility into a posturing statement of empowerment. I mean, if that's not feminism and leftism in a nutshell, I, how did Trump become the symbol of blaming other people with, for your problems? I mean, when has Black Lives Matter ever taken responsibility for any of the dysfunction in inner city neighborhoods? When have feminists ever said, oh, maybe this is us, maybe it's a problem with us, maybe, I mean, this is what the left has been doing forever. And on top of this, the fact that Taylor Swift has not denounced Trump, has not actually gone out of her way to denounce Trump, is bringing her under fire because they say, well, maybe maybe she supports Trump as if that were some kind of crime. So this is like, this is this war, this culture war that's going on uh, to define everything, everything decent as being anti-Trump. And it's really going to be interesting to see if intel, you know, one of the problems with Trump is that he is, he has not brought the kind of never Trump intellectual class around. And so he's going to be stuck in this culture with country and Western singers, basically, and those black singers who, who support him, because like these guys are just absolutely dead set on this image of him as the worst person, uh, of, you know, the worst person imaginable. And so that's what we're going to be seeing as we come into September, as we come into the new political season, it's going to be a fight for Trump to reclaim 
the moral high ground that he had as, on the day he won the election, when suddenly he said, these people have not been listened to, these people have not been appreciated, I appreciate them. All right, it is time for sexual follies. <laughs> Before, before, hold that because we're going to end with that. Um, before I get to the one thing I really want to talk about, uh, I, I just have to have a shout out to my friend Obian Uju Ikiocha, who you call her Uju because who can pronounce it? She got. She is a very powerful opponent of abortion, uh, especially trying to keep abortion out of. Africa, which he says is essentially cultural imperialism. These white, you know, upper class people come in and say, oh, what you really need is abortion. And she says, no one in Africa thinks abortion is a good thing. And so they're selling this Western idea of these crummy values. And she got into an argument with Bill Prady, who is the uh, Twitter argument with Bill Prady, the executive producer of the Big Bang Theory. It's really interesting. So Prady first tried to argue that uh, the Abortion is biblically allowable because of a verse in Exodus. And the verse in Exodus, Exodus 21, 22, says, If men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she has a mis miscarriage, yet there is no further injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand. So in other words, they read this to say that the, the killing the baby is not actually killing, you just get a fine, but if you kill the woman, then that is really killing. Unfortunately, the translation is bad, and that's not what it really says. What it really says is if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that the child comes forth, in other words, if it causes a, the, the birth to be premature, then you get fined. But if there's any other injury uh, that to the, either the woman or the child, then it's life for life. So that that is a very, very dubious reading. So anyway, they get in this argument on Twitter, and Prady, the executive producer of the Big Bang Theory, says to her, well, are, what if somebody else's religion permits abortion? Are you going to just stick to, is only your religion valid? And he just said, well, it's still killing. It doesn't, you know, it's not the a point of the religion. And he said, well, I can't take you seriously if you're not going to allow other religions. And she said, well, then what about honor killing? Are you going to allow Muslims honor killing? <laughs> and Brady cut her off. He just, he, he, he blocked her on Twitter because that was a bridge too far. He would not denounce honor killing, basically. He wouldn't do it. So anyway, that's the, the level of logic. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that there are people having these arguments, but that's the level of logic you're dealing with from the left. Here is an article from uh, the New York Post. Cheap sex making men give up on marriage. Thanks to cheap sex, marriage may be doomed. The share of Americans ages 25 to 34 who are married dropped 13 percentage points from 2000 to 2014. A new book by sociologist Mark Regnerus blames this declining rate on how easy it is for men to get off. Regnerus calls it cheap sex, an economic term meant to describe sex that has very little cost in terms of time or emotional investment, giving it little value. Regnerus bases his ideas in part on the work of British social theorist Anthony Giddens, who argued that the pill isolated sex for marriage and children, add online pornography and dating sites to the mix, and you don't even need relationships. The result is two overlapping but distinctive markets, one for sex and one for marriage, with a rather, rather large territory in between comprised of significant relationships of varying commitment and duration. In generations past, women generally made men wait until marriage to have sex, to get a wife and therefore sex. Men had to be clean and presentable and have a good job. This, Regnerous Reasons, gave men all the motivation they needed to become respectable members of society. But now with porn on demand and greater reproductive freedom, sex is a commodity available at any time. This has left men with little motivation for marriage. Now, I, I want to talk about this because, first of all, I'm not convinced that it was ever that hard for men to get sex if sex was what they wanted. But what I really think, I don't, I don't think any, I've never heard anybody talk about this but me, is that ever since the Industrial Revolution, the profit to be gained by children has gone down and down and down. Children used to be called the poor man's wealth. Why? Because they worked your land. They did things for you. They helped that you out. They helped you build your business. They became part of your business. But with the Industrial Re Revolution, as 
the profit-making centers moved into cities, children left home, and sometimes they sent money back, sometimes they didn't. Their skills didn't exist in the father's time, so the father couldn't pass skills on to them. They became separated from the family. Children have become less and less of a profit-making business. So just looking at this from a materialist economic perspective, a child today only costs you money. There's some chance he'll take care of you when you get older. And conservatives complain. They say, well, the government takes care of you now, so that means children don't take care of you. But that, that was the government reacting to the fact that children now leave home. Children are almost entirely an expense. So think about this for a minute. If you're a materialist and children are entirely an expense, children do not bring any money in. They only take money out. Children have very little value. Who else has value as a person? Who else loses value as a person? If children lose value, women lose value as people because their special gift is they bring life into the world. So if you're a materialist and children just take money away from you, then women's pr productive powers, which used to be their real power in the world, used to be their value and their power, have gone away. And that explains a lot of feminism, why feminists are insisting that women's value doesn't have to do with the home, doesn't have to do with raising children. It has to do with doing things that men do as well as men do them, which is unlikely because if you believe in evolution, men were evolved to do certain things, and that's why they do them. That is why they do them. It's not like it's not like flying a fighter plane existed and that we said, oh, only only men will be allowed to do that. It's that flying a fighter plane was invented by men for men to do. You know, that's why, that's how it all happens. Now, listen, this is not saying that women can't find new avenues of value and all this stuff, but just remember this, that if you're a materialist, then children's sole value is economic. Their value has gone down. The value of children has gone down. And that is one of the reasons why birth rates drop in civilized, industrialized societies. And I think this is something we need to deal with because I believe, of course, children are a great spiritual benefit that everybody should have them. I believe that they make life life. I believe they make show teach you the meaning of life. I believe that children and the homes that women make for them are the most valuable things that happen in human life, far more value than being, having far more value than being the CEO of a company and all these things. But it's not all about sex. It really is about the entire economics of the human family, which has changed with the invention of machinery. And I think that is the thing that women are dealing with to, to construct new value for themselves in a in highly industrialized and highly uh, mechanized society. And the thing that men are dealing with when they think, oh, here we have this powerful sex drive, but if it leads to having a child, suddenly it's gonna cost me money. You know, that's, those are questions that can only be addressed on the, on the spiritual plane or if you address them on the economic plane, I think a lot of people are not going to like the answers, including left-wingers. All right, that is sexual follies. Show me that thing again. I'm so easy to entertain. It's, it's like, I'm, I'm just so easy. All right, tomorrow is the mailbag. It's a short week. You got to get that mail, those questions in fast. Get them in now, and I will be back tomorrow. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show, and we have Sebastian Gorka with us tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh,